Hello, uh, my name's Gary Brown. Uh, today I'll be um, introduce, introducing you to um, NIR and, and MIR spectroscopy, uh, specifically uh, talking about its application for inline use. Uh, on, the, on the screen uh, here you'll see a picture of a, or the, or the, the subject title is a rotten apple could turn your product into a lemon. Uh, this is um, uh, more apt than what you probably initially would think and I'll discuss uh, applications that we've used it for uh, fruit uh, towards the end of the uh, presentation. Now, what is um, what is NIR or MIR spectroscopy? Well, it uses the it uses the uh, electromagnetic spectrum between the wavelengths uh, of say 200 nanometers up to 2.5 uh, micrometers. Uh, you can break it down into five different components. Uh, the first being, say, 200 to 350 nanometers is what we call the new, the near UV. And then we move into the visible part of the spectrum, which is between 400 and 700 nanometers, uh, to NIR, which is 700 to 2 point or 2, 2,500 nanometers, and then into the mid MIR region, which is 2.5 um, up to 100 micrometers for mid, mid, mid IR and far IR. Uh, how is the light used in, uh, in uh, near infrared spectroscopy is that you illuminate your material or your product with a uh, source light and then looking at this uh, diagram here we can see that the, uh, there's three, three ways that light is transferred or, uh, through or reflected back off the object. Uh, in the box you can see the, uh, the molecules that we're looking at. Now the light will be either reflected from the uh, from the material, it could be absorbed by the material, or could fully transmit through the material. And we can use reflectance or transmission of light to uh, measure the properties of the material or the product. Uh, so we talk about for a few different, three different, potentially three, for uh, inline use. We talk about three different modes of uh, of infrared spectroscopy. Uh, the first is full transmission where the, the light goes completely through the material or the product and then it's uh, measured by a detector. The second, if, if the, for materials that uh, we can't, that light can't uh, trans, transfer through, we talk about diffuse reflection of uh, light. Uh, also there's a method that we can use to um, use internal reflectance of a, uh, of a crystal where the light transfers, bounces or transmits through the crystal similar to a fibre optic uh, cable um, and where it interacts with the surface of the crystal and our material we can also measure the properties of the, of the material. Uh, here's an example of uh, the spectra, the absorbent spectra that we've that we've got from a few different, two different types of material. So you see on the bottom axis we're looking at uh, from 1500 up to 2500 nanometers uh, and we're looking at the reaction of water and glucose. So you can see on the water band, and they, we call it a, a water band because it's a very dominant uh, feature, is that at 19,500 uh, nanometers you have a, a huge amount of absorbance of water. Uh, and this becomes uh, problematic uh, when we start to use near infrared spectroscopy for measuring any any high moisture products, and you can see the opposite with the effect of glucose. So glucose is not absorbent at, at all at the nineteen thousand five hundred nanometers, which is the exact opposite to water. Now, diff depending on the regions we're looking at, uh, they interact differently with the with the material. So in the new near UV spect uh, spectroscopy, uh, electronics transitions are the predominant absorption of energy. Uh, and that can be used for uh, measuring uh, pep peptidic bonds in proteins and aromic amino acids. Then we move on to the visible spectrum and we all associate that with uh, uh, colour cameras or, or vision systems is that we're looking at the uh, electronic transitions in uh, molecules and theirs typically can be used for carotenoids and uh, measurement of chlorophylls uh, and we've used that successfully or very easily in the past to measure uh, the chlorophyll levels of fruit for instance. The next region which is probably the NIR region which is uh, more it's, it's more applicable to inline use uh, in inline use of NIR spectroscopy is is uh, is the first 
area that uses absorption bands related to molecular vibrations. And it's widely used for uh, composition analysis. So from, from NIR, we can measure uh, the, the amount of uh, protein in uh, wheat, for instance, or the amount of uh, sugar or total soluble solids in uh, fruit or in fruit juices. Uh, in meat, it can measure protein levels and fat levels. And it's the one most, quite, most widely used for inline use. Uh, MIR is, is also a vibrational spectroscopy. Uh, it's not as useful for uh, inline use because uh, it absorbs light very, uh, very, very strongly, and the material thickness uh, is quite is, is can be, needs to be quite thin for it to operate. But it is very good for measuring proteins and uh, polysaccharides and lipids, for instance. Uh, so, how does molecular spectroscopy? Uh, Work well. What happens is when the light interacts with the material, you then get stretching, uh, symmetrical stretching, and asymmetrical stretching of the uh, bonds in the molecules. And that, as those as those stretching occurs, you can think of it like a spring between the molecules. So as the molecule as the molecules uh, distort or move or stretch, then energy is absorbed or uh, uh, by the molecule. And the energy exchange occurs between the radiation energy and the energy contained within the uh, molecule. So here's a, a picture of, uh, uh, we can see uh, a molecule. So we've got a, a t two different modes. We can have well, two different ways the lights can uh, react with the molecule. You can see a reflected uh, wavelength when it hasn't affected the molecule at all. It's just uh, bounced off the, the molecule. Uh, whereas you have an absorbed wavelength which actually is injected energy into the uh, bond between the C and the H part of the molecule. And it's, it, and it's that absorbed wavelength, the interaction with the molecules which we use to determine the molecular structure. Uh, molecular groups, so the infrared spectroscopy is very sensitive to uh, molecules containing uh, CH, OH and uh, NH bonds. So any any material which is predominantly consisting of those uh, molecular bonds will react very strongly to uh, new infrared radiation. Uh, it interacts with the NIR portion of the spectrum. Uh, typical typical uh, material that uh, we which uh, we can uh, measure are uh, starch and sugars, which are CH, predominantly CH, alcohols and moisture, which are predominantly OH, and protein, which is uh, NH. Uh, now, it, MIR versus NIR, uh, the, the, mirror, the uh, MIR absorption is the fundamental vibration energies uh, whereas, and uh, are heavily absorbing, whereas the NIR absorption are overtones of the fundamentals, which are the first, second and third predominantly overtones in the CH, NH and OH vibrations, uh, and uh, also... Um, yeah, electromagnetic spectrum. So there's overtones and combinations of uh, vibrations. So here we've separated out, expanded a little bit the wavelength of interest for the NIR. So we're working from greater than probably 800, so from 800 nanometers here to 2500 nanometers. So on the right hand side you can see that you've, you've broken down the, the combination bands and the overtone bands of the CH, NH and, uh, and OH uh, molecules. Uh, there's a lot of analysis been done on the different different molecules and how they react to the uh, either the combination of uh, bands or the overtones. Uh, if you look across the the top line, we've seen we've seen water here. So uh, water has um, combinations in uh, two, 2200 nanometers, uh, and then the first overtone starts at 1900 meters. Second overtone is at roughly 1350 nanometers. And there's two third overtones. Uh, so how does how does uh, near infrared spectroscopy work, or how it can be used to analyse our materials? is determined uh, by Beer's law. Is um, a friend of mine, Eric, and he reckons he knows all about uh, Beer's law. But uh, uh, his belief is that the uh, absorptivity of alcohol is um, proportional to the uh, size of the jug, and uh, rather than uh, any uh, 
scientific notation. But in actual fact, uh, Beer's law is uh, the absorbance of uh, light is determined by the molar absorptivity of the uh, material, the uh, path length, and the concentration of the material. So if we, in our, our um, near-infrared spectroscopy, if we can keep uh, path length constant and uh, we're, using the, we're measuring the same material, so molar absorptivity will be constant as well, then the absorbance gives us a direct relation to concentration and that becomes a very useful property. Uh, unfortunately, Beer's law is uh, not perfect. Um, it can can vary or deviate from its uh, perfect state because of uh, particle scatter, uh, interference, so we've got contaminants in our material, uh, molecular interactions, uh, changes in refractive index will also affect it, stray light, and changes in the sample size and path length. So a lot of those things we can compensate to for a certain extent. Uh, the last one, changes in the sample size and path length, it's important when we're measuring um, our material in line that we can uh, keep those two constant. How can we uh, improve on Beer's law to reduce the errors? Uh, well, we, when we, now, when we uh, process the data from the, um, the spectrometers, uh, we pre-process the data before analysis using multiplicative mul scatter correction. Uh, also, you can use standard normal variate correction. Um, baseline correction, for instance, uh, second derivative, first derivative. Uh, and differentiation, Spitzkola is probably the most uh, widely used uh, differentiation process uh, used in near field spectroscopy. So here we're going back, progressing a little, going back again to the few different modes of collecting light from, uh, from, our, from our subjects, from our product. Uh, we have the source light, so in A we're looking at uh, pure, pure full transmission, so we have the source light, we can uh, then transmit through the sample to the detector. The detector is, um, would be far in an inline situation, would be fiber optically coupled back to a spectrometer, and the source light is uh, often also uh, coupled to the sample via, via a light source through a uh, fiber optic cable. Uh, the sample would be uh, in line, so there may be some way, some means, or there may be special means we need to uh, adapt to the sample so that we can measure the uh, the, um, the spectrum from the from the sample. Uh, B, we're looking again at the uh, crystal, where the light source uh, reflects through the crystal, similar to a fiber optic cable. The sample is sitting at the interface of the crystal. Uh, and the light interacts between the surface and the sample, and then sampled by the detector. Uh, that that principle is used uh, can be used in line. It can be put for liquid trans transmission. Uh, it, uh, you can be the liquid will um, encompass or around the crystal, and therefore the detector will then sample sample the liquid. Uh, C and D are, um, or C particularly, is not used in line. It's a, it's uh, used for laboratory use only. Uh, and D, we're looking at uh, specular reflectance, where the source light is um, focused onto the sample, and our detector measures the reflected light from the from the sample. Diffuse reflection is often can be used for uh, powders uh, or any or anything that's uh, too too thick or absorbent to work in transmission mode. A uh, difficult part with in near, with uh, diffuse reflection is that you can often get uh, light which reflects from exact from the surface of the of the object and doesn't transfer into the object at all, uh, and that's what's often termed as uh, metallic reflection, uh, and that's causes, for in effect, it's a stray light because it hasn't interacted with the material, so it will interfere with our signal. And sometimes you can get so much reflection from the surface without it being diffuse that it can override the diffuse light, which is the light we're interested in measuring. So with our work with uh, fruit uh, in the past, uh, with the uh, Central Queensland University um, uh, we actually came up with a, a, a light, an interactance probe, which we patented, patented. And how that works is you can see the uh, the probe 21 uh, is actually sitting inside the uh, the light source, uh, the globe being 11. 
uh, and casts what it does is casts a shadow on the on the fruit, or it could be any object for that matter, uh, and that eliminates the spectral to a large degree, reduces the spectral reflection from or the metallic reflection from the surface of the fruit. Uh, or the object, so we know that the, the sample source, the sample light we're getting is actually diffuse light and not um, and not reflected completely, f- totally from the surface. So how do we use Beer's law in, uh, in near-infrared spectroscopy? Uh, is we need to calculate absorbance. So absorbance is simply the, uh, the log 10 of, of Beer's law, uh, and it's calculated by I ref divided by I. Now, IRF is, is the reference light source uh, divided by I. So, for instance, if, you're, if you reference your light and you measure the transmitted light and they're equal, then you have no, no absorbance of the transmitted light. Therefore, log of 1 goes to 0, so absorbance equals 0. Uh, if, your, if your intensity of your light through your sample is a tenth of your reference, so it's fairly heavily absorbed, then uh, log, log 10 will go to 1. So you can do a, you do a plot of uh, absorbance, and that's used uh, to, to determine the um, concentration of the of the material. Here's an example of uh, spectra uh, that's that's measured, and we've uh, determined the absorbance of the material. So it's log on the left-hand axis. You've got absorbance between zero up to 1.1, 1.2. Uh, and on the bottom axis, we have the wavelengths of light. So this is this is uh, raw uh, sunflower oil uh, in variable in variable concentrations. So you can see the change in spectra as the concentrations changed. Uh, now, wave, wavelength selection. There's a few different ways we've got to do that. So with, with the previous slide, you saw that the we had the graph broken up um, across wavelengths. So what the instrument has to do is to be, uh, has to be able to measure the intensity of the light either in transmission or reflection uh, at various various wavelengths. And typically, the resolution we need is somewhere in the order of, depending on what we're trying to um, predict, uh, we'll need to measure down to probably 0.5. Uh, up to say 2.5 uh, nanometers per per pixel, if you like, uh, and that can be done by enough, a number of methods. Uh, we can use a, a rotating disc. Uh, there's a few instruments out in the market at the moment that use have a uh, rotating disc with say nine different filters, uh, and rather than get a continuous spectra, uh, what they do is <coughs> they get the uh, the amount of light either reflected or transmitted at nine different wavelengths. And if you know what you're predicting and those nine wavelengths can be adjusted appropriately, then that works fine. Uh, the downfall of, or the limitation of those systems is that they can only work in what they've been calibrated to, um, calibrated to for the filters that have been used. So you can't just click light uh, from a different material and expect to get the same result. That won't work. Uh, optical tunable filters uh, are just similar to a light filter, except the, the way they behave is determined by uh, a, an optical signal. Um, and also, you can uh, set the op- op- similarly, liquid crystal tunable filters operate in the same similar manner, whereas the light passing through the filter is determined by either an optical signal or an acoustic signal. Um, now, monochromator uh, is another different method of determining the wavelength selection. Uh, this disperses light uh, with a wide range of wavelengths onto a monochromatic light at a different wavelength. So an example of that is a rotating diffraction grating uh, where the light source uh, is reflected onto, is focused onto a grating and the grating will then separate the light into a, multiple, a multitude of uh, wavelengths. And then often that grating is uh, rotated, and we use the as the ro- as the grating rotates, we use the uh, wavelengths individually to illuminate the object and measure the objects or the samples um, absorbance at that particular wavelength. So it's a scanning type device, and it has to move through all the wavelengths. So it takes uh, takes in the order of a second or so for the um, f- for the device to measure measure the uh, spectral spectral signal from one, one object. Uh, and you can do it in two ways. You can either be classified as pre or post-dispersive. Uh, so the, 
Uh, so the light can either be uh, broken up into individual wavelengths before it's, it shines or it passes through the uh, object, or you can pass all your light through the object and then measure the uh, light coming out uh, and tune and tune to specific leaf frequencies after the light's uh, transmitted through the fruit, through the object. Uh, now, we've mentioned before that a, a diffraction grating is what is used to uh, break up the light. So here we have uh, a grating which is similar to nothing more s simply, uh, s very similar to a C CD. If you hold a CD up in the, in the light, a sound CD or DVD, you'll see a rainbow effect on the, on the, um, on the CD face. Well, it's, that's simply, simply exactly how a diffraction grating works. It's just a, um, a glass which have, has uh, ground or cut into it a heap, a, lot, a very lot of fine lines running parallel, and when the light reflects off the grating, it'll be broken up into its different wavelengths. Now, once we've, once we've uh, <coughs> uh, the light is uh, transmitted or reflected off our, off our material or product, we have to then measure measure the signal. Uh, so the the we can do that with a number of different different devices and uh, different different materials are useful for different wavelengths. So here we just see a range of different materials that are used and uh, the wavelength range that they're useful for. So just an example: silicon is the most widely commonly used, the cheapest, most economical, uh, and that's useful for 599, 600 nanometers up to 1100 nanometers. Uh, once we start going down the, the chart in longer wavelengths, then uh, they become more expensive. Um, in gas, is works between uh, 800 nanometers up to 1.6 or 2 nanometers. Uh, the disadvantage with silicon is very good, and it uh, can be very uh, signal to noise ratio can be very very good. Whereas the signal to noise ratio drops off with in gas devices, so that's a bit of a trade off uh, when you're looking at spectrometers. And once again, you work in the MIR region, which is not used typically uh, for inline use. Uh, the devices get even more expensive. But there's no option because the uh, silicon just won't work in that range. The light will just go straight through a silicon device. Uh, with with the inline use, we need also need to be mindful of uh, how we uh, measure the signal at the uh, at the at the device or at the surface of the uh, product. Uh, we can use, typically we use fibre optics to do that. Uh, and the, what we need to be mindful of is the absorption of light on the fibre optic cable itself. So here you can see there's a graph uh, of absorbance of uh, light versus wavelength. So you see once you get up to, up to uh, greater than 1900 nanometers, then a large proportion of our light is gonna be absorbed a significant proportion of our light is going to be absorbed uh, by the fiber optic cable itself.